Money's a great employee, but a terrible boss, right? And in our accumulation phase of our life, it typically employs us. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today on the Make Your Money Matter Show. This is a show dedicated to helping you create a better relationship with your money. Today we're gonna to be talking about, actually a very important topic in my opinion, right? Why you need a financial advisor, what to look for in a financial advisor, and really why they have so much value to you. We're gonna be talking about some different stats, some studies. Also, I'm gonna go through my nearly 20 years of being a financial for you because honestly, today we live in a world where we are consuming information at warp speeds. And we know it's easier than ever before to access any information we want to get. But I think it's more difficult to find truth, which is why it's so important to find a trusted advisor that can help lead the way on your financial journey, which again, leads me to the topic of today's show, which is finding a financial advisor or a financial Sherpa. Now, if you haven't already done so, do us a favor and smash the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Let's get into it. So I wanna start off with a question. Who was the first known person to scale the summit of Mount Everest? And you're probably going like, Brad, wait, what? <laughs> How do we go from being a financial advisor to scaling Mount Everest? Now, there's a reason for this. And anyone I ask this question to, anyone who knows about this story would probably answer, and the answer I get most often is Sir Edmund Hillary in 1953. And if you answered that, you'd be right. But Hillary wasn't alone. He was accompanied by his Sherpa, a guy named Tenzing Norgay. A Sherpa, for those who know, is a native Himalayan guide who knows the mountainous regions of Central Asia, and they help climbers complete their expeditions by preparing hiking routes and really sheltering them from from life-threatening events and elements. A Sherpa's knowledge and experience, if you really break it down, is what makes them invaluable. But what if I told you that decades before Hillary's journey, a man named George Mallory was thought to have been the first to scale Everest? You'd probably be like, I still don't care that much, but you will in a second. But no one really knows the name George Mallory. Why? That's really my kicker here. Why do you not know that name? Because he never returned home. His remains were actually discovered in 1999, and he was found, believe it or not, in his rappelling gear, which, if you think about it, indicates he was on his way down the mountain. He had also told his wife before he left for this trip, he would leave a photo of her at the top of the summit if he were successful. When they found his body, this photo was not on his possession, which really gave more indication and more proof that Mallory did indeed make it to the top of Mount Everest. I wanna ask another question, why is it that most people have never heard of George Mallory. Because unlike Sir Edmund Hillary, he had not successfully made it down the mountain. In fact, the majority of deaths in Mount Everest occur not on the ascent, but on the descent. I gotta be honest with you, I kind of nerded out on this story, not being a mountain climber myself and looked into this. And according to the Scientific American, of the 212 deaths that have occurred on Mount Everest between 1924 and 2006, 192 of those, that's 90% for my numerical nerds out there, myself included, 90% are attributed to climbers who were on the mountain's descent. The difference between these two men, Hillary and Mallory, and their efforts is that Hillary had a guide, a Sherpa, who had the experience and the knowledge of the terrain. This was the key to Hillary's success. So why is this story so important? Why am I sharing it to you on a make your money matter financial investment show? Well. I actually think it's a great illustration of the retirement planning journey, the investment journey, if you will, the wealth growth, the wealth accumulation journey. How does this relate to your retirement, you might be thinking, or to anything that we're gonna speak on on this show? Well, I actually think there are retirement lessons to be learned from the Hillary and Mallory Everest adventures. Let's bring the image for a second of a mountain back into our mind's eye. Let's, let's, put, a, let's put an image of a mountain there. All right, you look at it, you're staring at it. All right, so let's compare a Mount Everest expedition to our financial journey. As you are ascending the mountain on the upward climb, you're in that what I call the accumulation stage. And many do a terrific job of accumulating income. Many of you watching right now may be in this stage. The accumulation stage or phase is essentially making it to the top of your own 
financial mountain. But the challenge is making it down that mountain into your retirement years. And I want to pause for a second. When we talk about your retirement years, it doesn't necessarily need to be 65 or 67 or 70 years old. Retirement really means being financially independent and financially free. And retirement, however you want to define it, really is important to understand two things about retirement, two important things, liquidity and income. We're going to talk about these heavily on this show, so stay tuned. But ultimately, when you come down the mountain and we get into retirement, that's when we leave our accumulation phase and enter our distribution phase. Now, at the base of this mountain, again, hopefully you're still envisioning that, right? When you are in the beginning of your working years, let's say your 20s, maybe your 30s, you're just beginning your career, you begin to save money for retirement or ultimately save money to be financially free at some point. But you have a long way to go, maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years until you reach the top of that mountain, which in my analogy here represents retirement. Now, as time passes, you enter your early 40s, you begin to save a degree of money for retirement, but at this point, you're only halfway up the mountain. Now, it should be clear here that although the stats show in the analogy between mountain climbing and retirement planning, in mountain climbing, the stats show that the descent, essentially in our analogy, the retirement years, actually tends to be the more difficult. You might be thinking, well, Brad, wait a minute. The accumulation phase has so much in it, and I agree. You may have bought your first home, started a family, paid down that home, put kids through college. Let's be honest, that 30, 40 years of the accumulation phase that we are all in, there's a lot going on. It is hard. It takes discipline. It takes discernment. The two Ds I talk about on this show and around how to build wealth and maintain it and protect it. And we're doing that. Hopefully, we're all doing that in that time period. This is, by the way, where you want to seek counsel and find that advisor to really help shape that plan and keep you on track, something we're going to talk about today. So just because the descent is a little bit more treacherous doesn't mean well, I don't want to downplay the ascent, the accumulation period. But as you're moving for that accumulation period towards the retirement years, let's say you got 20 years to go until you reach the summit, then one day you wake up and in the blink of an eye, 40 years have passed. Many of you watching right now are probably like, yeah, that happened to me recently. And you find yourself in your 60s and you're standing at the top of this mountain. And by the way, it could be your 40s. It could be whatever time period you want to do for be financially free. You find yourself at the top of this mountain with retirement at hand. You've accumulated all the retirement assets uh, that you're going to accumulate at whatever time you're ready to go. And hopefully if you're working with an advisor, as it relates to our story here of a Sherpa, you're avoiding some of the pitfalls that can happen along the way. But this is only the first half of your journey. And if we look at the comparison, the more difficult or dangerous road actually lies ahead. Understanding that during our accumulation period, we are actually working for our money versus our money working for us. Hopefully you're getting some good growth and we'll talk a lot about that. But in retirement, that's where you honestly get that notion of working smarter, not harder. Letting your money work for you. I often say this, money's a great employee, but a terrible boss, right? And in our accumulation phase of our life, it typically employs us, if you think about it, right? We're working for it. It, it. it has a lot to do with our constraints of what we can save for, what we can spend on, what house we can buy, what school we put our kids in. I mean, so many things go on in this accumulation phase. Ultimately, at some point, and something we strive here at One Capital Management for our clients, at least when we sit with them and provide our value as an advisor to them, is to give them peace of mind. Most people watching right now are probably like, the value of an advisor is really to make me money, right? Well, let's think about that for a second, because everything I'm talking about here, especially as the analogy around a Sherpa and Tenzing Norgay and why we know about Sir Edmund Hillary and not George Mallory, is not necessarily what shows up on a statement. It's the things that you avoid that really save the money and ultimately provide the peace that most clients are looking for. I can't tell you how many times I sit with a client, whether it's from our radio show, our podcast, our show, or referrals we get from our clients, we're very blessed to have a lot of discovery meetings. And in those meetings, the common denominator by far is the anxiety and fear around running out of money. And they're looking for counsel to really set their path straight and keep them on that path to understand the value of making sure we avoid some of these pitfalls, making sure you work with an experienced person who knows the terrain, who knows the climate. Myself and many of our advisors, myself, I have 20 years of experience being a financial advisor. I've seen the terrain. I've seen 
legislative changes. I've seen different economic environments. And many of our advisors here at One Capital Management have seen the same. And again, I'm not saying that all roads lead to One Capital Management. This isn't a all roads lead to One Capital kind of conversation, but the importance around what we actually hear talk about of why an advisor is so important to complete that second half of the journey, not just the accumulation phase. In switching gears for a second, when we talk about the value of an advisor, and I mentioned a comment earlier around, you know, when you look at an advisor or someone, you know, an investment manager, right? A lot of the, the quick calculations are, what is that person making for me? What is the earnings on the rate of return? And again, if you can see from the analogy around planning, and I made this analogy as well last week, something I, I refer to often is when you look at a car, as an example, you really want to understand that what matters is what's under the hood, right? You want to understand that it, it can get to the destination you want to go. And in this discussion, the destination is being financially free, right? Understanding where your retirement is and, and living out the goals and objectives you have. And we are heavily involved in our clients in the accumulation phase, designing great portfolios, unique portfolios that fit into wealth forecasting and really overall retirement strategy. So when you look for an advisor, you want to find someone that number one, you trust, one you actually enjoy talking to. I kind of think that that's not talked about a whole lot, but you actually want to have some joy in talking with that person. Like you engage with them, you connect with them. Like that matters because this is a relational situation. This isn't a transactional. And by the way, if you meet with an advisor that's more transactional baked, trying to sell products or commission related things, you have to really question that. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's important to make sure to put it into your world and make sure it's right for you. But trust matters. You also want to trust but verify. Ronald Reagan said that, right? So make sure you go through their background, their history. Make sure you understand where they're coming from. I mentioned this in the last episode as well around understanding the three things to look for an advisor independence, fiduciary, and credentialed. You can go back to that show and take a look at it, but it's really important to look for those things. Now, when we talk about finding an advisor, it's really a two-part study, right? It's the advisor, it's also you, it's the client. So we need to actually look inward a little bit to understand what it is that we are actually looking for. And I wanna show a study because every year, there's a study that comes out, it's actually the Dalbar Report, and it actually has to do with investor behaviors. This ne isn't necessarily the value of an advisor, but it has a lot to do with understanding who we are before we go and meet with an advisor or sit with an advisor. Now, switching gears from the planning, the advising side, and talking about the second part, which is the investment management. Now, I want to show something on the screen here. And what you're seeing here is the average investor and how it potentially can lead to underperformance. Now, a little context here, for example, this is going back on the S&P 500, okay, the average asset allocation for the fund investments, okay, compared to a balanced model of the US blended index. And then that fourth column there on the right of Delta, that's the difference. So let's go all the way back to the left for a second. You can see in the different time periods of 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, let's go all the way back for a second. Over the past 30 years, the average asset allocation fund investor earned 2.95%. A balanced US blended index has earned 8.9%. Think about that for a second. The average investor, 2.95. An average blended index, 8.9. The difference, 5.95%. Said differently, we don't have a market problem necessarily. We don't have an investing problem, us as humans, all of us collectively as the market. We have more of a behavioral problem. I share this story a lot. Veronica and I, my wife and I, our trust account, our 401k, our assets are managed by the same portfolio manager here at my firm at One Capital Management as my clients for two reasons. One, I'm a believer in what I preach, number one. But number two, I can't really sit kneecap to kneecap with my client and truly look at them in the whites of their eye and say, I wouldn't react disciplined in March of 2020. I like to think I would. I mean, I like to think I know what I'm doing over 18 years, but I'm still a human. I cannot disconnect my logical mind from my emotional mind. And I think that matters for all of us to share that story and really understand it's a two-part situation, the, the advisor and us as clients. And understanding and going back to that slide for a second, the investor behavioral side, it really understands that if we were to just, as an example, 
put it into the S&P 500 and lost our password. Okay, you lost your username, lost your password, just forgot about it for 30 years, as an example. That fund would have probably done what it's showing here as the stats, 8.9%. But we as investors, just managing our account, going through the volatility over the past 30 years. And by the way, real quickly, think about the last 30 years as context, using that number for a second, right? Think about it logically. What have we gone through? We've gone through a pandemic. We've gone through a recession. We've gone through a tech bubble. We've gone through a war in the early 90s and really another one in the early 2000s. I mean, we've seen volatility. We've seen volatile and kind of crazy political environments. We've seen different parties in our administration. So we've seen a lot in that 30 years. And to see the index, in this case, a blended index, again, set it and forget it in a way, it would have earned 8.9% based on this study. But us as average allocated fund investors, 2.95. That's a, almost a 6% difference. Now, what I want to bring back up on the slide for a second, that far right column, inflation. Obviously, it's a big word right now, and we know it's kicking up given our supply chain issues from last summer. Uh, obviously, oil and things that are going on with this war in Ukraine and Russia that's going on. I mean, very sad over there morally. But we're seeing inflation. Now, the average inflation over the past 30 years was 3.38%. Now, what I want to make very clear on this is other than the loss of almost 6%, based on if you just lost your password, right? The average fund investor earned less than the average inflation over that same time period. That, I think, from this study blew my mind. So when we talk about investing, finding an advisor, finding a good investment manager, we have to look inward as well. Understanding is there's a lot of people watching here that are DIYers, you know, uh, do-it-yourselfers and want to manage their own fund, get indexing here and there and all those kind of things. And that's nothing wrong with that, okay? But really truthfully ask yourself, when you offload that, you offload what? objectivity, you offload an unbiasedness, making sure that you're able to really sit with someone that you feel can trust really to start off with, but also has the experience to be able to manage a portfolio, manage your IRAs, your 401ks, your trust accounts, your, your whatever it is, the investment side that fits into your overall planning. Those two need to go together. Find the who of the advisor and those three things I talked about on last show, which are really important for today when you look at the value of an advisor, an independent, a fiduciary, and a credentialed advisor, those matter. But you also wanna look at yourself too, is what are you looking for? And if it's just from investment management, back to that study, it's very interesting to look at it, right? Are we really, and I say we collectively, are we really the best at managing our own money, right? And I, you know, look, I share this sometimes too, like I'm not a car guy, I showed this before, but you know, I take my car to a mechanic because I'd rather him work on it because he knows what he's doing and I'd rather pay for his time. There was actually a, a study I heard, I think it was someone who said this, and it kind of cracked me up, right? A plumber came over because they had a little bit of a plumbing issue and they found that they unclogged the toilet, 20 minutes, charged them 200 bucks. And the guy was like, wait, what? $200 for, you were here for 20 minutes. He goes, I'm not paid for my time. I'm paid for finding the problem and fixing it. Just because I'm good at it and did it in 20 minutes, doesn't matter. So I share that story. It might be a little simple one, but it, we talk about fees and those kind of things of when you pay for an advisor and finding that value, you want to make sure you're paying for two parts, the fiduciary aspect of being a good financial advisor, understanding discovery, understanding you creating creative and, and tailored and custom planning for you, but also understanding how they manage money, why they're managing money and the team they have built out for that. All those questions are really good. And we'll talk about this on a, on a future show around some questions around what you should be looking for an advisor. I think a lot of times I get some questions from our radio program, from our podcast, and even from the show and prospective clients around I'm not really sure actually what to ask in an advisor. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But putting a bow on the conversation here for a second around the value of an advisor and what to look for. Think about it this way. Professional sports. It's a great example. A lot of us watch it, whether it's golf, whether it's hockey, whether it's football, whether it's basketball, whatever it is, right? Why I'm bringing this up as an example is look, look at golf, for example, right? Why do you think some of the caddies are making 10%? They're, these professional golfers are paying them 10% to help them on the golf course. You don't think Tiger Woods knows what he's doing on the golf course, right? He's still paying 10% to his caddy. So when we talk about the value of advice, when you, when you try to equate that to a dollar amount, understand in context what that means. Every professional team I know about in either baseball, basketball, football, uh, they have a coach, right? They have someone that helping them align 
the strategy to get down the field to ultimately win the championship in our world. Obviously, that means retirement. So kind of looking at sometimes, I think when we talk about finding an advisor, it's really important to find someone you actually have trust in and want to better yourself with. It's no different than looking at a trainer, for example. You want to get healthier, train more. What are they really doing? They're actually keeping you disciplined, right? They're saying, show up on Wednesday, show up on Friday, show up on Saturday, whatever it is, right? We here at One Capital Management, any good advisor wants to do a couple things. And the two Ds I talk about often are discipline and discernment. You understand those kind of things. Keeping discipline is actually pretty hard sometimes, right? But we need to do it. It's the matter of fact, one of the biggest things I see with clients is actually the discipline to getting through to what their goals are, keeping on track. And an advisor, this will not show up on a rate of return, but like a Sherpa who's been there before, who's experienced the terrain, helps make sure all the different things that life throws at us when it comes to our money, that we're able to get down that field, get up that mountain, whatever the analogy you want to use, right? We're able to do what it is to achieve the goals and objectives you have. All right, so this is the part of the show where I want to answer your questions. So if you have a question or a topic, maybe it came from this show or other shows, or you're just watching this and you have a question you want to think of, um, and you'd like me to address, leave a comment or a question in the comment section. Or again, if it's something a bit more personal or you want to go through it one-on-one, -on -one, just go to our about page on this channel and send us an email. We'll always keep the questions uh, I read here and I answer here anonymous, so you never have to worry about your name being shared but we'd love to hear from you. You can leave a comment again or a question on our social media channels as well. So one of the questions that came up actually from this show and talking about it, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, we'll probably have actually a show on this to go more in depth on this question. But the question was, what questions should I be asking a financial advisor? Right off the top of my head, I think a couple ones, some of the ones we actually talked about here today as the value of an advisor are actually good questions to ask. Everything from what services do you provide? Believe it or not, different advisors have different specialties and different services. Uh, that's an important one. How many clients do you serve is probably another one to make sure to kind of see what kind of clients they serve, where their specialties are as well, but also, you know, are they open for new clients? Do they have time for you? Those, those kind of matter. Uh, credentials, as I mentioned earlier. You know, asking what kind of credentials do you and your staff have? It's really important to understand that. Um, I think investment philosophy is a big one. What is your investment philosophy? I think this is a big question that a client should understand about what it is they want the answer to be and what it means to them. Are they more aggressive or conservative? And I talk about this a lot. I think those are adjectives being used in this industry that they don't necessarily define who you are. So we can help. And I think a good advisor will help you discover that of yourself, but understanding what their investment philosophy is, Obviously, questions of what are your fees, things like that. Do you sell products? Are you fiduciary? These are all good questions to ask when it comes to uh, what to look for, what to ask a financial advisor. Now, the second question uh, for today actually came through is, what's the difference between a financial advisor and a private wealth manager? Well, nothing and everything. <laughs> and here's what I mean by that, right? Most times if you looked up private wealth manager, what's the difference? You can probably find a Google search on it. I guess I probably should have done this before I answered it. But the reality is, is the difference usually being read about is something to do with net worth. If you're above a million dollars of net worth, give or take, things like that, you're more in the private wealth space. The reality is a financial advisor and a private wealth manager are doing the same things. They should be doing the same things. A financial advisor is more of a term used for, I would say, the retail space. Something you would find a main on main shop, uh, managing an account that you might have a smaller account of a mutual fund situation or holding. They're usually employed uh, by a larger firm. Private wealth advisory, which is what we are here at One Capital Management, is more what I would consider in depth. Now this, by the way, this answer is a little bit subjective, so you can take this how you want to, but it's a little bit more in depth. They really wanna, we, I know, really wanna sit with you and discover who you are and what you view your money and how you view it, but also understanding how we can provide value to you. I think a lot of times in the financial advisory space, they're kind of typically more trying to sell something or have a product that's supposed to be the end all be all. And again, I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying that you know, you want to look at that in context of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish, right? But the reality is, I think when it comes to private wealth is, at least from our perspective, is really three things. Relationship management, investment management, and ultimately advanced planning. And advanced planning is that integration I talked about, that comprehensive plan, that putting together all of it, your income, your outflow, your assets, and then not just growing it, but also protecting it. Because at the end of the day, you're going to most likely have a great 
career and the accumulation phases I've talked to, finding that value of an advisor and specifically an advisor that's a private wealth manager and a, and a financial advisor. And I wanna say this, actually, I wanna debunk one thing that you might be looking up and it has to do with this question. Wealth management is for everybody. It's for anybody. Anybody who is intent and intentional, I should say, on growing, maintaining, and protecting their wealth. And if that crosses over to the financial advisory space, fine. But understanding that private wealth, if you wanna look that up and understanding what that actually means is finding an experienced Sherpa, an experienced financial advisor who's been there before, who's experienced, who has the answers to those first that first question of what their investment philosophy is, who they serve, knowing their clear vision to help know and to help better serve you is really the ultimate answer when you're looking for the value of an advisor. And again, if you have a question or comment you'd like me to read here on the Make Your Money Matter show, leave it in the comment section or email us. You can email us on the about page on our channel. Before you go, if you found anything helpful on this show and wanna learn more about us in particular, you can visit our website. It's up there on the screen or give us a call. We wanna help. Listen, there's no pressure here. We don't treat people like a number. In fact, we value our relationships. It's the lifeblood of what we do. So click, call, or text us today. And if you're not following us on our social media, you should be. You can follow us at Make Your Money Matter. But most importantly, thank you for spending part of your day with us. And as I always say, if you like the show, share it with someone you like. And if you don't like the show, I guess share it with someone you don't like. But until next week, always make sure to make your money matter.